I'm very excited about our next speaker. Uh, Scott Trailer has been coming. He's, he's part of the DNA of this event. Uh, he's been um, a uh, somebody who's, who's always thinking about how to tap into the power of this technology for children. Um, and he has children, and they have shaped what he, he does. Um, and he is also quite childlike himself, as you'll soon see. All right, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, Scott Trailer. My name is Scott Trailer, and I'm the chief kid and founder of 360 Kid, a nationally recognized content and technology development firm. I mean, it's making great products for kids. We offer our services to businesses in the education, broadcast, and toy industries. Um, I thought I would try something a little bit different today. This is, uh, I thought I'd experiment a little bit, and I, I love the idea of thinking about participating in a presentation. That's why uh, I got some, uh, some laser pointers for you. But anyway, let's get started. And the way that we get started is we need to calibrate our presentation. So this is the calibration screen. I'd love it if you could just all hit that spot, and as soon as we have a critical mass, that looks pretty good. Oh, now we're gonna go up here. Thank you. 
While we may not see how film and television relates to software and video games, directly it all plays a part in the experience for kids. So, it was great. I feel like I have to know you guys. Uh, thank you very much. All right, well, we're going we're gonna to get warmed up. We're going to start off with the Stroop test. How many people up here are familiar with that test? Okay, and for those of you who aren't, the Stroop test is um, a visual item identification kind of exercise where a word will be displayed on the screen, like the word red, R-E-D, but the color of the word may be blue or black or yellow. And what you need to do is shout out the color of the text, not the word. Okay? So, I want to hear you all shout what the color of the word is when I get it up on the screen. Okay, oh, shout your least pointers here to get started. Black. <laughs>
how two to three year olds may spend as much as two hours a day with screen time. Now the research talks a lot about television viewing. Um, one can assume that they're also talking about other kinds of screens, uh, whether they are computer or handheld or what. But surprisingly, from the population, I mean, the demographic from zero to one year old are watching up to an hour and 20 minutes a day. Um, I thought this was kind of pertinent based on a number of the products that are coming out now for zero to two year olds. And sometimes I wonder, is this marketers that have found a new market, or is this saying something else <coughs> about the collective society and what we think about media exposure for young kids? Is it okay? Is it not? Um, you know, it, it's in the household anyway. Are parents using it in ways that are unexpected, that result in that much time? Uh, another rather shocking statistic from this same report um, is that 19% of all zero and one year olds have a television set in their room. It's, I mean, that was unbelievable. Even four to six percent, and forty-three percent, forty-three percent have televisions in their bedroom. Um, this particular Kaiser Family Foundation study um, has some interesting findings about why there may be TVs in the bedroom, and it has more to do some, with some people about, well, I don't want them to sleep in my bed. I couldn't figure out another way to get them out of my bed, so if I have a TV in there, they seem to be more interested in sleeping in their own bed. Um, and there are a number of other findings in these studies that are, are shocking. Um, but uh, TV is, is really just about everywhere at every age and in larger quantities than you would imagine. I also found this really great stat about um, how many kids who have access to computers and access to the internet. That you'll see here that preschoolers, <laughs> by and large, have about 67% have access to a computer and about 23% have access to the internet. Um, that's, that's a pretty large amount, and, and this is only going up year after year. This study uh, was a couple of years old, and it was just released last month uh, through the <coughs> Department of Education. The toy industry for the last many years has hovered somewhere between <coughs> about $21 billion and $22 billion per year. This year, it's on an uptick where the, um, we will most likely hit $22 billion and exceed it. And there are many categories within the toy industry we'll talk about later, but two of the biggies that I think many of us are, are interested in are learning and exploration and uh, electronic goods as uh, toys are shown to be this year the hot items out of all the classical toys or any kind of other toy categories that you may find. And I wanted to compare that against um, the computer and video game uh, industry that one thing of note, NPD and their stats on the toy industry are now starting to merge in video games and handhelds and so forth, where historically they, they haven't focused on technology as much, but our concept of what a toy is is changing, <coughs> as well as concepts in other areas related to childhood. Um, this is only, you know, they're going to bring 7 billion, I, I, I've heard that they're going to come close to 8 billion, billion this year. I find it hard to believe because this fourth quarter, much of the new consoles are not out. Many of the new titles are not out yet. Um, this is a grand opportunity for a very brief moment in time for CDs to have a small bounce back, very small, before all the new titles and the new consoles hit in the first quarter next year. I did, a, I did dug a little deeper on these numbers, and one of the interesting things I found out was um, EA, if you just look at the sales that EA does within the US, they represent anywhere from 22 to 24 percent of the gross annual sales in computer and video games in any given year. Um, and if you include THQ um, and Take Two, it's anywhere from 36 to 42 percent of 7 million in a year, just within the US. So we're only looking at the Miller Reports uh, findings within the US. Oh, yeah, that's just some stats I thought might be kind of nice to know, helpful to know about where we've been with some of the larger parts of the, of the industry. If I can ask you to click on the Looking Forward button. Oops. Hello, oh, Looking Forward. Okay, there we go. Um, a recent stat from the MPD group talks about that within the next five years, there will be 6% more children than there are today of ages five and under. Um, that sounds like a great opportunity for <laughs> companies that focus specifically in that space, as well as a 4% increase in children 6 to 8. If you look at the tween uh, demographic alone, that you'll see that everyone
everyone I'm sure knows that they have quite a lot of uh, their own spending power as an economic group, 39 billion this year, and by 2009 up to 42 billion. Now this is this is what's in their pockets. This doesn't even go into consideration what kind of purchasing uh, uh, influencing they have on their parents. Uh, there's there's some information. There's a lot of information out now talking about uh, the nag factor and, and uh, parents maybe buying a Ford over over uh, a, or a Prius over a Ford because their kids are telling them what to buy. Um, so that we're looking at dollars here that they just happen to have on them, but they influence much more beyond that. Uh, Warren had shown this slide the other day, and the reason I put it back up here is that I'm sure almost all of us are familiar with Moore's Law. Every 18 months, the uh, processing power of uh, computer chips doubles. And it's gotten to the point, sometimes I argue, well, how fast does a chip need to be in order to do your email and Word and all that kind of stuff? Obviously, it has benefits in the gaming space, but if you're looking at um, electronic toy products, or you're looking at low-end consumer electronic products, you, you're driven by the cost of the chip where you could double or quadruple the speed of your chip within a couple of months if you wished. And really what's driving it is the cost of the chip. So it's amazing to see a lot of these technology products out on the street now with chips anywhere from 50 megahertz to, you know, to 200 megahertz. And they're low-end and they're affordable. And, you know, that's what my computer used to be 15 years ago. And I thought, wow, isn't that great? And now it's amazing to see how those chips are entering into, uh, they're part of uh, Super Toys. Um, I want to touch on this briefly, the, the One Laptop Per Child initiative out of MIT's Media Lab uh, with uh, Dr. Nicholas Negro Ponte. Uh, you may know a little bit, or uh, maybe not, that you know, Dr. Negro Ponte's mission is to get 150 million of these laptops made and distributed around the globe to children for uh, learning purposes. Uh, what's interesting is most of them are earmarked in their plan to be outside of the U.S. Um, there may be a few here and there, but they are pretty, they, I believe they've almost nailed down the hardware design. They have a manufacturer in China. Um, they have, it fluctuates anywhere from a million to nine million, depending on who you talk to, commitments through the UN and um, other uh, countries across the globe. Why this is noteworthy, if this laptop is to sell for $100 a unit, and the first ones to roll out to the press will be somewhere around 135 140 dollars a unit, um, by the time they get in, uh, you know, with some higher numbers, they can get the cost down to, I've heard, as low as $79. What is of interest, I think, to us is not whether this product succeeds or not, and I greatly hope it does, but even if it partially succeeds, the technology involved in the monitor, uh, this monitor costs $15, and chances are it's going to go down, and it's a 640 by 480 monitor. Can you imagine what that means within an electronic toy product? Can you imagine what that means to the future of computing within the U.S.? Um, and again, you know, if you apply Moore's Law to this product, the, uh, while it's an onboard chip of 500 megahertz, it's really clocked at about 250 megahertz, which is plenty of speed for this thing for most people that, you know, just get online. One other interesting note, most computers use about 30 watts of power. This one uses two. The Media Lab is intending to license the technology of this product. Could you imagine Barbie's first spreadsheet? Do you know what I mean? It, 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 it's, it's amazing what you could do with, the, with uh, the innovation that's going on behind this initiative. And um, there are many more things besides Barbie. <laughs> well, it, that's changed over time. It was hand cranked, but they also have another mechanism where you can pull it. Uh, they're talking about maybe something, a foot pedal, maybe it changes. So no electricity. Yes, but it's There's all self-powered by body movement. I heard the crank was not robust. The what? The crank turned out not to be robust. Yeah. So that's why they parted with it. Okay. And I, I think there was also issues about if you're turning it on the device, the cost the damage to the device itself when you're doing that. Okay, uh, I mentioned to you, uh, uh, a number of super categories within the toy industry, learning and exploration, and youth electronics. These kind of one laptop per child and what's going on within gaming um, and uh, uh, the 
the larger numbers we're seeing in the toy industry, I think, says a lot of great things for these categories in general, but specifically learning and exploration. That has been, if anyone works in that space, and that tend, I mean, you know, it's the leapfrogs, it's the Fisher Prices, um, it's the Publications International, that learning and exploration has been a category year over year that returns uh, positive, uh, it drives the industry and it's always growing year after year, whereas many of these other categories do not, say like dolls may take a beating in one year, but for the last five years, and it's expected now to be six, learning and exploration is going to uh, continue to make, maintain and be strong. So why will learning and technology be hot? These are some things that uh, my gut tells me will help the consumer market with learning products. Uh, there will be pushback from No Child Left Behind, where parents who are told their schools are underperforming, their students are not doing well, their children are not doing well, they're going to say, I've heard you say that now for years, I'm tired of it. I think it's good, I don't care what you say. I really expect a pushback from parents in the year and years to come soon, because there are underperforming schools who can't improve, even with help. And the parents are, they've had it. It's rhetoric. Where's the help that I need if it's not so good? So I think there will be a backlash with No Child Left Behind. I think it's interesting to note the aging baby boomer generation. And as they become grandparents and they are interested in buying products for their grandchildren, what kind of things are they more likely to buy? I think something that would help their children get a leg up in learning. There is this perception that they need to be school ready early. And I think that is something that is driven by society about kids and, and, and uh, classrooms and getting into Harvard early and all that kind of stuff. But um, advances in learning games, it's amazing to see how fast and how quickly um, the learning game, uh, games effort has grown and uh, games for change, games for health, um, that I think that all will feed back into growing nice learning and technology uh, sector. Advances in portable computing, I can I can't wait for just another year or two to go, go by. And I can't wait for my whole computer to be my phone so I don't have to lug around a laptop anymore. Wirelessness everywhere. Um, there's more and more blurring between the consumer electronics and the toy industry. You probably don't need me to tell you that, but it, it's showing in the data from uh, NPD that they keep restating their numbers year after year because of this change. What is a toy? What's not a toy? What, what should we be considering for numbers that drive this industry? Media options will only continue to grow. And uh, I'm very excited about you know, the future of uh, different um, unique interface devices, cameras, sporting equipment. Um, it could be bricks, it could be sneakers, it could be anything. And I feel we've just scratched the surface about what, uh, what's possible with them. Um, with inputting information into any kind of digital device. I see, I see um, e-books making a comeback again. I, I can't say it's a strong one, but there's a lot, there's a groundswell uh, growing right now with e-books. I don't know if you've heard or are familiar with Amazon. It's got a new e-book that, um, that kind of got leaked, I think by accident when they filed a patent that people have to see that uh, Amazon is really committed to creating an e-book for uh, a website service. And there are many other players that are interested in the same space as well. Social networking, uh, we've talked a lot about on and off over the last few days. Uh, obviously, Club Penguin is a company to watch. MB is another one, uh, specifically targeting younger kids, uh, kind of a safer MySpace, but for kids so parents don't have to worry about what they're seeing, who they're talking to. And I haven't heard it, it, many people talk about this, Though there's been much conversation about plug and play devices, um, you know, plug and plays go into NT NTSC monitors for a large part within the US, but there is a growing uh, amount of sales with high definition television. Could you imagine your plug and play within a high definition television? What does that mean? Well, it means a whole different kind of chip set and experience on a plug and play toy. But why couldn't there be plug and play computers? Why do I need a monitor with my computer if I have a high definition uh, screen right in my living room? And one might argue is we've all heard that Microsoft and Sony are trying to race to a path to your living room. This might be the way to get there. 
Okay. How am I doing on time? Uh, tight. Tight? Okay. Childhood 2.0. I think I can get through some of this stuff kind of quickly. Um, one, I, I, someone had told me, I, I was at a conference at, I mean, a, um, a weekend event at Highlights for Children just last month, I think it was. And um, the new CEO, Ken Johnson, said something fabulous. He said, children have remained the same throughout the ages. It's the society around them that changes. So if you think about it, you can think about childhood in one or two ways. You can think about that childhood as a human being, a child, or the experience that is dictated by elements, forces around a child that have nothing to do with the child themselves. You know, school, religion, governments, uh, changes and advances in medicine, uh, different industries, all have some bearing on the idea or maybe even the social construct of what childhood is. So if you think about it, um, the experience of a child, say, in New England, would be very different than someone uh, in San Diego, than someone in Brazil, than someone in Egypt, because the factors that drive the experience of childhood are different from nation to nation. And so I would say, well, if a child can't do anything about making childhood, the experience of childhood better for themselves, well then whose responsibility is that? It's ours if we have the power to shape those other elements around the childhood experience. So I ask here, what can we do collectively as a group of insiders, of smart people who are committed to kids, that can benefit the experience of childhood for all children everywhere. Um, someone had said, you know, a, a single insect has some intelligence, but when it's in a community like a beehive, the collective, the, the social uh, knowledge is much greater than any individual member. And it can live longer than any individual member within the society. And I look at this fantastic group of people here to say, we have the power to shape the things that surround kids and children, the social experience that dictates how good or how bad their childhood could be. Um, if you could point at this screen one more time that we, I had asked, you know, what category do you fit into here? And stay on the circle as it moves. that all of these industries come together and we actually shape the experience of childhood. We are influencers of children's experience, good or bad, right or wrong, that it is within our control to some degree if we work collectively. Okay, um, I was just gonna talk about two small ideas here. I, maybe some of you are familiar with um, Eunice winning uh, the Nobel Peace Prize for what sounds like a small idea giving micropayments out to people uh, in Bangladesh, $5 here, $20 there. Uh, and he started a bank in 76 that only focused on doing these small things. And uh, up, up to date, he's given away over $5 billion worth of microloans to people that have really shaped their future for the better within Bangladesh. I think like uh, it was a small idea that had huge gains for society. And what kind of small idea could we think of? Or even a large idea? Um, maybe some of you know, maybe some of you don't, that there's actually kind of a, a document listing out the rights of children across the globe that was, uh, that, has been in the, that was in the making for 10 years and has been approved internationally about what do we expect the experience of childhood to be? Um, there are 54 points. How are we safe? How are we not exploited? Um, how do you know, we have the right to know our parents is one of the points. And it's interesting if you go through it to see how lucky you are, or how we all are within the US. Um, uh, it, it was an idea that took 10 years to make happen, but once it's there, it's shaping the globe. So I ask all of us to think about, it doesn't matter if you have a big idea. It doesn't matter if you have a small idea. What's important is that you have an idea and you share it. Um, could I ask you, Leah? Um, I have some cards to hand out. They're out? Could I ask you all, as I flip through here, I was going to 
say we need to have a Dust from Magic manifesto and a Bill of Rights for what would make for great products for kids and benefit the experience of childhood. Okay, this is your last great speech. What can you do to make childhood better for children? I, I ask you to write an idea on this card. It could be a small idea, it could be a big idea, but I ask you to know that you will be sharing it. So.